Hello, everybody. Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, on this Martin Luther King Day. Very glad to be with you for a special edition of Virtual Voices of the Game. And as always, this program and all the other public programs that we do virtually, uh, they are brought to you through the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. We thank Ford for sponsoring these events throughout 2021. Today, we do celebrate Martin Luther King Day. And we're gonna do that in, I think, a very tangible way by talking to former major league outfielder, Manny Mota. Manny played 20 seasons in the big leagues, compiled a lifetime batting average of 304, and was named to the National League's All-Star team in 1973. Manny will talk to us about Dr. Martin Luther King, the Pirates' reaction to his assassination in 1968, Manny, we want to welcome you to the program. You're out on the other coast in Los Angeles. How are you doing these days? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Today, for me, this is a special day. It should be for everybody to remember the great Martin Luther King, Dr. King. He was a great human being. He was the defender of civil rights and also a person who cared about the poor people. It's a great honor to remember him. It was a sad day for us, but today we remember him for what he do for everybody, especially for the African-American and Latin American players. Let's set the scene. 1968, Manny Mota, Pirates platoon center fielder, splitting time with Matty Alou. Manny would also uh, fill in in the left field as well. In 1968, Manny was coming off a season in which he had batted 321 for the Pirates. And this was at a time when pitchers were very much dominating. So a 321 batting average in the mid to late 1960s, highly impressive. Now, as a team, the 1968 Pirates featured a number of Black and Latino players. Not only uh, was there Manny Mota and Matty Alou, you had Don Clendenin, Maury Wills, Jose Pagan, a couple of Hall of Famers, Willie Stargell, Roberto Clemente. And then on the pitching staff, you had Bob Veal, Al McBean, and Doc Ellis. The Pirates were the most integrated team in all of baseball in 1968. April the 4th of that year, and this is still at a time when baseball was just wrapping up spring training. It was Thursday, April 4th, 1968. The civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., was assassinated by a man named James Earl Ray. Pirates general manager Joe Brown, in response to the players on the Pirates, agreed to cancel the final spring training game that weekend. It was a game against the Yankees. It was going to take place in Richmond, Virginia. But Brown said he could not postpone the first two regular season games, which were scheduled to be in Houston against the Astros. He could not do that without the permission of Astros management. As the home team, the Astros had the final call, and initially, they hesitated at the Pirates' request. Well, the Pirates' players did not like this non-committal response from uh, the front office and from the Astros. So they voted to hold firm on their decision not to play the first two games of the regular season, Monday, April the 8th, Tuesday, April the 9th. After discussions with Astros officials, Joe Brown offered a compromise. The team would not play on either Monday or Tuesday, but would play on Wednesday, April the 10th, which had originally been scheduled as a travel date. At a clubhouse meeting, all of the Pirates players, Blacks, Latinos, Whites, they voted unanimously to accept Joe Brown's plan. Manny, take us back to those early April days, 1968, when you first heard about the assassination of Martin Luther King it was obviously a shocking time for the entire country, but you as a black Latino were certainly very directly affected as well. Tell us what you remember about that difficult time. I remember that was a very difficult time. When we heard about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, we have 11 players on the team in between African American and Latinos, and that was the most, the largest Latin American player in African American player in any team in the National League. And we refused to play. I remember Don Clendenin and Roberto Clemente. They were the leader. They talked to Mr. Brown. 
about the situation, and we refused to play that day in honor to Martin Luther King. And Manny, it was unanimous. I mean, there wasn't a single player that went against us, correct? That was unanimous. And we're so pleased and grateful to the rest of the team to join us for that cause, to bring in honor Dr. Martin Luther King, because we don't feel like we should play to really pay tribute in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm curious, Manny, you know, you were born and raised in the Dominican. When you first came to the United States, how much did you know about Martin Luther King? Well, I heard about Dr. Luther King, Santo Domingo. I was reading the paper about he was going through, about what he was doing. And he was doing the right thing because he won equal right for everybody. And he cared a lot about the poor people. And just like the African-American players on the team, when you were playing in the 1960s, especially in the minor leagues, there were times when you and the rest of your minor league teammates tried to go into a restaurant and you and the other black players, you were simply refuse or uh, not allowed to, to enter. You were told you've got to get out. Some nasty things were said to you by the <laughs> owner of a restaurant. It was something that you have detailed quite a bit during your life. But I remember we were playing the Texas League, and there was a lake now. We were looking for a place to eat. So we found a restaurant, and then the man here, who was very nice to us, he going to the restaurant with the other teammates. We were about four black players on the team. We stayed in the bus, waiting for the okay from the manager to see if we'd be able to go near the restaurant. Okay, the manager came back, he said to us, we talked to the manager of the restaurant, and he was also the owner. He said, he will allow you guys to come in. Okay, he said, we asked, are you sure we can go in? He said, yes. We get off of the bus, and we get to the entrance of the restaurant, and guess what? The owner of the restaurant opened the door, and he got a shotgun mm. on his hand. And he said, you guys not allowed to go in my restaurant because I not allow nigger or black people to be in my restaurant. Can you think about that moment? That guy with a shotgun, what about if he got nervous and he pulled the trigger? I will be talking to you right now. And that make us feel bad because not allowed to join our teammates. And we appreciate what the teammates do for us. They come out of the restaurant with their about uh, what happened outside and they leave the restaurant, and then we get to the bus all together. They backing us up. But that was a bad experience. I was really nervous. With my other three teammates, we were doing the four guys, the uh, black guys in the team. And that was a scary moment for me. Did you feel that the other players supported you in that situation, the white players on the team? We feel we got support from them because they leave the restaurant, and they yeah. joined us. And they refused to eat because they wanted backing us up in that situation. And I remember one time talking to Willie Stiger. That, that was funny. That was talking to Willie. And Willie used to live in Asheville, North Carolina. He used to drive to spin training. And he <laughs> he's stopping the gas station to get some gas. So all of a sudden, the police come to Willie. And they say to Willie, hey, boy, that lady right behind you, that white lady, she say, you've been following her. And Willie say, no, I, I don't follow that lady. Mm. And, and they say to Willie, Willie, seek five. And Willie say, yes. And the officer say, no, you call me, sir. You say, yes, sir. Willie say, yes, sir. Willie was nervous. He, talk, he say that. And then the police tell Willie, Listen to you, nigger. We don't want you to follow the white lady because if we hear about you follow the white lady once more, we will kill you. We kill President Kennedy, and to kill nigger like you is nothing to us. That was a really sad story. 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard enough to deal with that kind of virulent racism, but then you have threats of violence, people threatening to kill you, uh, police officers in some cases threatening to put you in jail uh, for things you obviously did not do. You mentioned a moment ago, Manny, Don Clendenin and the role that he played. He was the Pirates' first baseman in 1968. He was very good friends with Martin Luther King because when Don Clendenin went to college. He went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. Dr. King was his advisor. He went to his house. He had dinner with King and his family. He became friends with King. So here was a guy who was as emotionally affected as any pirate player, more so when he heard the news of the assassination of Dr. King. Here's what Don Clendenin said to the Sporting News about the pirates not wanting to play those games immediately after the assassination. This is what Clendenin said. We feel we cannot play these games out of respect to Dr. King, since we have the largest representation of Negroes in baseball on the Pirates. Clendenin went on to say, we are doing this because we respect what Dr. King has done for mankind. Dr. King was not only concerned with the Negroes or whites, but also poor people. We owe this gesture to his memory and to his ideals. Manny, tell us a little bit about Don Clendenin. He was obviously a tremendous man of principle as well. Don Clendenin, he was like you mentioned, man of principle. He talked about Martin Luther King, and he talked with Roberto Clemente because I think I believe Roberto Clemente met Dr. King in Puerto Rico. He went twice to Puerto Rico, and Roberto got the opportunity to be friend with him. And then he and, and Clendenon, they used to talk about Martin Luther King, about his ideas, about what Dr. King was trying to do, what he was fighting for. So I remember being near them, they talk about Martin Luther King, and they got a great deal of respect for Dr. Martin Luther King. This must have been a heartbreaking for Don Clendenon, because this was, it was not only losing a civil rights leader, this was losing a close friend. He was, he was. I remember seeing Clendenon cry that day together with Roberto Clemente. And that was a really sad moment for all of us because we feel the same way Clendenon feel about losing a great friend and great human being in Dr. Martin Luther King. We see Clendenon in the middle of our slide. And then on the right, you have a picture uh, Dave Wickersham, um, obviously he was one of the white players on the team. You had 14 white players on the opening day roster. And I guess to show solidarity, Wickersham, along with Roberto Clemente, they issued a joint statement about the Pirates and their desire not to play these games on Monday and Tuesday, the first two days of the season. So the, the release from Wickersham and Clemente was a joint release, said, we are doing this because we white and black players respect what Dr. King has done for mankind. So there was no tension on the team here between white and black players over this. This was a, a complete um, act of solidarity. Obviously, all the players uh, were on one, uh, the same side. Um, what about the general manager, Joe Brown? Uh, he was a man known for being very open-minded. Uh, he signed, recruited many Latino players. Um, but he was caught in a difficult situation because he is not a player. He is representing management. Baseball at the time was a little bit more conservative. Do you think Joe was caught a little in between here? Well, he was caught a little in between, but Mr. Brown, he was a person who understood the situation. And he got a great deal of respect for, Mr. for Dr. Martin Luther King. And he knows how we feel about this, about what happened that day. And he really gave us protection. He gave us support. And with the team, we together as a team. And Mr. Brown respect your decision and respect the decision we made about refuse to play that day. He understand the situation. And I was so grateful to Mr. Brown for understanding about what happened that day and to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. As we look back at this very difficult time, a tumultuous time, not only in baseball history, but certainly in American history, and, and you, you think about 
what was going on at the time. And you have a prominent player on the team, in addition to Don Clendenin, that also knew Dr. Martin Luther King quite well. And that was Roberto Clemente. Here we have a great photo of you, uh, I guess taken a few years ago in a Dodger uniform. We see the younger Clemente in the inset photo on the left. But Clemente knew Dr. King as well, maybe not as well as Clendenin did, but they apparently, King and Clemente had met at Roberto's farm in Carolina, Puerto Rico, back in 1964, and they had talked about civil rights. They had talked about some of the issues of the day. So Clemente was also personally affected by this. Henry DeWas, I know Clendena and Dr. Creed have a good relationship. They were good friends. And Clemente was inspired by Dr. King to help poor people. They keep calling each other, they keep communicating each other, and they work together because they got the same idea because they care about the poor people of the whole world, not only the United States, people of the whole world. And they want to do something to make their life better. And you mentioned earlier that Martin Luther King was very concerned about poor people, people that you know, came from underprivileged uh, backgrounds. And that was something that Roberto Clemente always talked about. He always talked about how he, he loved poor people. He, he didn't like to hang out with rich people and people that had everything they wanted. He liked to be with poor people, the people that struggle. That was always something uh, that he felt this uh, association with. Now, what ultimately came out of the Pirate players standing in solidarity, opening day Monday, those games postponed. Tuesday, which would have been the revised opening day, also postponed. So nobody played on Monday or Tuesday because this sort of set in motion, kind of a tumbling effect. All the other teams in baseball followed the lead of the Pirates. So as it turned out, all the teams had their opening day on Wednesday. And that was unusual for the time. Normally, there were uh, the, the opening day games were staggered. A couple of teams might play on opening day. And then the second day, there would be more teams. The third day would be more teams. This was one of the few times in Major League history where all 20 teams, there were 20 at the time, 1968, and they all ended up playing two days later on Wednesday. And they all ended up playing simultaneously on the same day. As you look back at this, Manny, did you realize that, hey, we as players, maybe we have a little more power than we think. Maybe we have the power to influence the baseball establishment and we can put some pressure on them to do things that we believe are right. Did you feel that back in 68? Well, I am very proud of my teammates and also of the decision of the team owners not to play during those days. Because under that situation, we cannot concentrate and play in the game. Because if you see playing those days, we're not going to need focus on the game. We're going to be focusing on the memory of Martin Luther King. Let's talk a little bit more, Manny, about your relationship with Roberto Clemente. He was really the second great superstar that you played with. You came up with the Giants. You played a season with them in the outfield. You learned from a guy named Willie Mays. Uh, you then went to the Houston Colt 45s, never played in the majors with them, but then spent some time in the minor leagues with Houston. And then from there, you end up going to Pittsburgh where you encounter Clemente. Now, you obviously both spoke Spanish as your first language, Clemente being from Puerto Rico, you being from the Dominican did he open up his arms right away to you, a fellow Latino player? Oh, Roberto Clemente, when I joined the Pirates, he was the first one to receive me with open arms. He welcomed me to the Pirates organization. I owe a lot to Clemente because I was, he was my idol. When I was Roberto Clemente play, I don't think I was the player. I think I was the fan because I enjoy watching Roberto Clemente play the game, the way they play the game, with a lot of passion and a lot of dedication. He was, without a doubt, one of my mentors with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Roberto Clemente made me be a 300 hitter. With his advice and instruction, I raised my average from 279 
to 321. That I owe that to Roberto Clemente. He was my, my friend. He was my brother. He was my mentor. And not only that, Roberto Clemente saved my baseball uh, career in the major league. Let me tell you why. One time I used to play against left hand, right? Tattoo Maria Lou used to play against right hand. I used to play against left hand. I remember there was a Saturday day game. We played Milwaukee. Warren Span, <laughs> 20 game winner, or the best pitcher of the league or in the major league that year, supposed to pitch. I checked the lineup and I didn't see my name in the lineup. I said, I don't know what's going on. Okay. About 15 minutes before the game start, Bill Maserosti, who was the captain of the team, came to me and said, Manny, you playing. Okay. That day I have a great game. I think about, I mean, about three for five, hit a triple, dropping about four runs. And I was so happy, so pleased. I never faced Warren Swan before. So I don't know what to look for. And I'm lucky. I have a good day. Good game against him, and I was so proud of myself, and not so proud of myself because I gave some hits and drive behind. Proud because I helped my team to win the game. Well, the game was over. I'm sitting in my locker in the clubhouse, and Roberto came to me. He used to call me Geronimo because Geronimo is my last name from my mother. Mm. He said, Geronimo, congratulations, because you're going to stay with the ball club. I said, what you mean, Roberto, going to stay with the ball club? Yes. Before the game, they have a meeting. They call me in the meeting. They had to send one player down. And they think about sending you down. And to me, that was unfair. I asked them to give you another opportunity. You have that good game, and that's going to save you to stay with the ball club. That was the type of person Roberto Clemente was. He do not tolerate injustice, and he thought there was injustice what they were trying to do to me, send mm -hmm. me back down to, to the minor league. If they send me down to the minor league, who knows if I ever came back? So I owe that to Mr. Roberto Clemente. Besides being my teacher, my hitting, my private hitting coach, he was my best friend on the team. He was my brother. He was a great people, great person, great human being. And proud to be from Puerto Rico and so proud to have his father and mother alive because he talked to his father and mother almost every day. Roberto Clemente, without a doubt, was a great, special person and great and special baseball player. I remember one time, <laughs> Roberto, you know, when we played right field, he was the best right fielder in the National League. I don't say in the major league because I care I was in the American League. Hmm. And one night, somehow, Clemente misplayed a ball on the right field line. Roberto, he was used to throw behind the runner when they got base to right field. When the guy made turn first way, he used to get a lot of guys turning first way with his throw from the right field. Yeah. Well, that day, somehow, he misplayed one ball. And the guy take extra base on him. He was, oh boy. After the game, he came to me and said, Manny, I said, you I want you to come early tomorrow. Okay, we get to the stadium. And he said to me, get a ball, get 75 balls. And get a phone. I said, wait a minute, Robert, I'm not a coach. I'm not a player like you. I said, go get the balls and get the phone. We went to home plate. And he stayed home play. He said, remember last night, I misplayed one ball and they take one extra visa. I said, yes. He said, okay, now I want you to give me a 75 ball because I want to find out why I missed that ball. Yeah. Do, being the best right fielder in baseball, he was so proud of himself being the best in that position. So I hit some ball and then when I hit the ball number 40, he told me to stop and come to right field. Okay, he said, he pointed to me where the ball hit last night and run away from him, and the guy take extra base on him. That was Roberto Clemente. Clemente, he was in want to be perfect. 
So not only that, after I got about 35 more goals, I said, just go and finish the book and give me 35 more goals because I want to make sure I don't misplay any more goals and anybody take extra weight on me. Mm. Latinos, we're so proud to get the opportunity to play with Roberto because Roberto, without a doubt, was a great, great player. I remember one time we got the Latinos meeting because they tried to make a controversy between Mesa and Clemente. And they say May was better than Clemente because Clemente can do him for power, he him for average, no RBIs. And, you know, as a teammate in Latino, we really heard about those comments. So we decided to call a meeting and call Clemente and the meeting the Latinos guys on the team. And they told me to start the meeting, talking to Roberto. And I said, you know what, Roberto? We feel the meeting is right. When they talk about men's being better than you, you know what? Because you he's single. <laughs> May hit home runs. May get 100 RBIs. He for average. You hit for average, Roberto, we get no RBIs. They got a reason to say May is better than you. We wanted to touch his heart and his, hear his feeling and his pride. Okay. He said, okay. I say, hey, Robert, they okay. May is much better player than you. Look at the number. Power, RBIs, average, you don't do that. He said, he got mad. He got mad and said, okay, we got it what we want to. And he said to us, okay, I'm going to prove it. I said, wait a minute, Roberto, we don't believe in work. We believe in action. Just do it. And then we're going to believe you. And after that, we got it where we wanted, where we wanted to be, to have him, to hurt his pride and to motivate him to give and be the player he's supposed to be. Because he could, he can put everything together. After that, Clemente start driving the ball, hitting home runs, finish the season with 100 and so RBIs, and he, he get to be the player he supposed to be because that talent, that was great for us, and we get it where we wanted to be. And I remember another story, and I hope sorry to take it so long. One time we play- Manny, before you do that, I, I just want to make a comment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Clemente went out in 1966 and 67. He still hit over 300, but he also hit over 20 home runs each season. And he had over 100 RBIs. I think he won the MVP one of those two years. So those two seasons, he went out and exactly did what you guys challenged him to do. Pick up your story. We challenged him and we're happy with the result. But we never said anything to him. He just let him be himself. And I remember he used to, when he used to get mad, he used to say, Puñeta! I say, hey, Roberto, tranquilo, tranquilo, easy. We play in St. Louis. Bob Gibson was pitching. He you know Bob Gibson. He brought you back anytime. And anytime Roberto faced Clemente, uh, Gibson drives there and my half, he does like, they hit Clemente intentional because they know Clemente can do damage. Okay. In the first at bat, Gibson he started, he Clemente, he cleaned in. Okay, when Clemente came back to the bench, he said to us, You guys watch my next at bat. I'm going to break that guy lay. You guys watch, hey Roberto, you're talking trash. What are you talking about? You crazy or something? He said, Puñeta, you guys listen to me and watch me. The next at bat. And unbelievable. Roberto used to swing two different models of bat. You won 36-36 against right-hander. 37-37 against left-hander. And that day, he wanted to get more wood on the bat, on the ball. He switched in that at bat game, Gibson. He switched from 36 to 37-37. The first pitch, Roberto hit a line drive. The ball went so hard to the mound and break 
brought gates on land. We said, wait a minute, this, this man is unbelievable. He predicted he was going to break his leg, and he did. And that was Roberto Clemente. We we're so impressed about him predicting breaking his leg and be able to do it. it was kind of hard for us to believe. Did Gibson know that he did it on purpose? <laughs> the only thing we know, they had to carry Gibson out of the, out, out of the mouth because he couldn't walk, because Roberto hit it so hard and break his leg. I'm trying to remember. I thought Gibson stayed in for another batter or two. And then finally, the pain was too much and he had to leave. He just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Pain was so much. I don't know what kind of velocity that will have when he played Roberto Clemente bat. And I remember it's funny because when Roberto Clemente came back to the guy, I say, I told you guys, I say, okay, now we believe you because we 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 believe in work, we believe in action. And we see some action for you and that are bad. We all know about Roberto's throwing arm, which is the greatest arm I've ever seen, maybe the greatest arm you've ever seen. You obviously have a, a, a longer uh, a breadth of experience to draw from there. But the other thing that he did that was so memorable were the basket catches, where he would put the glove out like this in front of him, and he'd make the play. Willie Mays used to do that too. Did you ever go up to Roberto and say, hey, teach me to do that? No, I didn't ask him about his defense because I enjoy watching him play, also watching me. And during those days, they were the only two outfielders who made the basket catch, Mays and Clemente. I remember one time, one day, I, was, I used to play center field, Platuno and Marielu. And that night, Roberto came to me, he said, Geronimo, anything to my right, Men on second and scoring position, get out of my way. Mm. I take care of that right center field. I, he say, worry about starting in left field and don't worry about any ball hitting to right center field. I say, okay, you got it. And that was Clemente. He, he can throw with the best. And not only that, you know, when you're taking field, you could lose for about 10 to 15 minutes. Roberto was always the last player when we play at home to come out of the right field gate, tie his shoes, and he used to play so ball, and he used to warm up throwing under him. I never see him warming up throwing over him. And he don't throw two, 15 minutes like a regular player to get loose. He threw about seven balls on the hand, he was ready to go. I really enjoy, not only enjoy, I'm learning a lot from Roberto Clemente about hitting and about how to play the game the right way. He really made me be a better player because he told me you got to focus, you got to concentrate, you got to trust and believe in yourself. And I don't forget those words. He said, Manny, Geronimo, you have to play. Just think at that particular moment, you are the best hitter on the game. He say only focus one thing, on the pitcher hand, and that's what you gotta do. And I'm so grateful to Roberto for giving me that, that kind of uh, illustration and instruction about how to play the game. Manny, one last question on Clemente. Did you mind him calling you Geronimo all the time? Did that bother you? No, no, because that was my mother last name. Okay. Only two people in the game called me by my last name, Vince Kelly and Roberto Clemente. Wow. And I remember Roberto used to uh, complain about his neck, about not sleeping at night. And one day we played Milwaukee. And Rigo Cari came to town. And Roberto, I was listening to them because I want to get some, get the pickled brains from those who here, from Rico and Clemente. And they're talking. And I remember, I remember say, when I don't speak well, I hear well the day after. And Rico say, we get in late last night. I hear well too. And without going too far, that was the best exhibition hitting. I ever saw 
in my baseball career. Between the two guys, they win 11 for 11. Wow. Rico Cardi win five for five, and Clemente win six for six. And all of those goals were hitting really hard. So I learned a lot watching those guys, the way they're hitting, the way they approach at the plate. And also, I pick up some brain from those great hitters, those two great hitters. Yeah, they were both phenomenal. They um, were tremendous contact hitters, despite the fact they both had power. Uh, they were exceptional at using the entire field, um, just phenomenal uh, all-around hitters. Um, and in Clemente's case, he was an unconventional hitter. He, he hit off his front foot a lot of times. It would not have worked for a lot of people, but it did work for Roberto Clemente. Manny, I want to go back to the man we talked about briefly a few minutes ago, uh, Joe Brown, who was the general manager for the Pirates in 68 uh, when the, the Martin Luther King story came down. I believe Joe Brown was the man that acquired you uh, from the Astros organization, if I'm not mistaken. And he was a guy that had a reputation for wanting to go into the Dominican, to Venezuela, to Panama, to Puerto Rico. He wanted to find the Latino player. He loved the Latino players, and he felt that was kind of an untapped market. I remember Mr. Brown, he... He had a great deal of communication with Latino players. I remember seeing him in the Dominican Republic during the Winter League, and he was looking for Latin players for which he think can help the ball club. And I'm grateful for Mr. Brown for giving me the opportunity to join the Pirates. We made that trade with the Houston Astros. He gave me the opportunity to play and to be teammates or the one of the greatest players of the game, Roberto Clemente. I got a great deal of respect for Mr. Brown because I had a good communication with the Latin American players and also with the African and American players. He was a great human being. I interviewed Joe Brown many years ago for a book that I actually did on Clemente. He was living in Mexico at the time. I believe his wife was from Mexico. And if I'm not mistaken, he spoke Spanish, correct? He spoke Spanish. Yeah, he, he got a good communication with the player with the Spanish. And one thing about Mr. Brown, he treat everybody with respect the way people should be treated. That was a great communication and player was not afraid to approach Mr. Brown and ask questions because he gave the player that confident to let them come to him. And it's no accident the 68 Pirates had 11 Black and Latino players. These were players mostly acquired by Joe Brown. He was a big believer in getting the best players, regardless of skin color, ethnicity, heritage. Uh, and he looked at all avenues, white players, Black players, Latino. If, if Asian players had been allowed to play in the majors at the time, they were not because of bad relations between the majors and the Japanese leagues. But if Asian players had been allowed to come here back then, I'm sure Brown would have been active in that market as well. Now, from there, you end up going to the Dodgers, but there's first a pit stop in Montreal. After the 1968 season, there's the expansion draft. The Expos select you uh, in the draft. Uh, you went to Montreal, a very cold place to play, playing in Parc Jarry or Jerry Park. Uh, but you only played there a few months because in June, they decided to trade you. You were in your 30s. They wanted younger players. And a real break for you. You get traded along with Maury Wills to the Dodgers for Ron Fairley and Paul Popovich. Tell us about this move and how it really resuscitated your career. Well, I remember playing for Mr. Jim Mark in Montreal. But, you know, coming from the Dominican Republic and uh, how well in Dominica and coming to Montreal, in that cold weather. And not only that, I was kind of rehabbing my elbow because I happened to broke my elbow during the winter before in the Dominican Republic. And uh, it was difficult for me to play with the broken elbow and rehab elbow, but I do my best, I try my best. And I remember one day we playing at home in Montreal and we played the Dodgers and Mr. Campanis, who got a great, great vision 
for Latin American players, he came to me. I was in the batting cage. And against the rule, he said, let me check your elbow. And he checked my elbow. He wasn't supposed to do that because I was against the rule. And I know Mr. Cavani from the Dominican Republic. He checked my elbow. He won't say anything, just left. And that night, I was supposed to be in the lineup. And about 10 minutes before the game, they changed the lineup. And they put me in the lineup. And the Dodger pitching Clay Austin, which I used to be lucky in Austin, and I got a couple of hits. Well, the next day, I remember they talk about the trades, about the Dodger want more wheels back. But the only way they can give more wheels back was if they throw me in the deal. Mm. And to be able to make that trade, they had to do that. So finally, I remember. We play in San Diego, and Jim Mo called Mori and myself to his office. And he said, we trade you guys to the Dodgers. And I say, okay, that's fine. That's, that give me, giving me the opportunity to be with a penal contender. And also, I feel what's going to help me in my rehab, because going from Montreal, in the cold weather, to LA in the hot weather, that really was helping me. And I'm so grateful to now when they made that trade because that, that really helped my career yeah. coming from Montreal to LA. Your first manager with the Dodgers, uh, Old Smokey, Walter Alston, Hall of Famer. Tell us about your relationship with Alston. Oh, Walter, what a man, what a person, what a character. He was a great person, easygoing, good communication, don't say too much. And he treats you like a player, like a human being. And I remember one time I got a poor groin, but I was sitting good. And I can hardly walk. And he said to me, Manny, you're going to be in the lineup. The only thing I want you to give me three at bats and I get you out of the game because I was swinging the bat so well. Mm. I take a curtison shot every day in my tie to be able to play. And also in my elbow because I was in rehab in my elbow. I used to take a curtison shot in my elbow to be able to play. Be able to play. And uh, I got a great deal of respect for Walter. He was a great man, good person. He won't say much. But we established a good relationship. He treated me not only as a player, he treated me as a son. Mm. And he used to be a good pool player. And he was without a doubt one of the best person a man I had the opportunity to play for. He retired at the end of the 1976 season. Tommy Lasorda managed a couple of games at the end of the year, but then in 1977, Tommy takes over as the full-time manager. Uh, of course, we recently lost the beloved Lasorda. Uh, he had been ill for quite a while, uh, 93 years of age, two world championships, great manager in his own right, but a completely different personality than Walter Alston, a completely different approach. That must have been a bit of an adjustment for you. Well... You made that judgment because you know Tommy was a very emotional person, good person, good manager, and we have a good relationship. I was so fortunate to play for Tommy, to coach for Tommy, and Tommy to us was like a part of the family because when we played in the Dominican and Tommy was managing, Tommy used to come to our house almost every week. We had lunch together. We had dinner together. We got out together with the players. And also, when you started the Manuela Foundation, I remember I used to go out and collect some items to groceries, to make some grocery bag and give them away in Christmas Day in front of the house. And Tommy asked Tommy to join me. And Tommy was 
able in every time ready to go with me. I say, Tommy, we got to go out today. We got to go out to buy some food, but we got to ask some people to give something to us. And when to buy, let's say, for example, we buy five sacks of rice, we get two for free. And that was Tommy. Tommy was a great, great person. I got a great deal of respect for Tommy, admiration. He was my mentor. He was my tutor. He protected me. And he treated me with a great deal of respect. He was a great, great human being. I remember Tommy, besides that, Tommy was the godfather of one of my children, mm-hmm. Manny Jr. That was so close relationship I have with Tommy, so close with his son, Spanky, his Joe, his wife, Joe, his daughter, Laura. And mm-hmm. I remember one time in spring training, Tommy was, you know, a little chubby. And Kerr Gibson, in order her childhood, used to kidding Tommy about being so fat. And Tommy used to bring a lot of nuns, used to come to see Tommy in spring training. And I remember Tommy talking to the nuns, and the nuns, they need some money to build a little chapel. And Tommy got to find the way to help, because Tommy liked to help. His relationship with the Catholic Church was very close. Yeah. And Tommy come up with the idea. He say, he called Gitson in, in Chaisa. He said, I need to lose so some many pounds. And they say, okay, Tommy, if you lose so many pounds in one month, we're going to give you $20,000. And Tommy said, okay, that's the deal. <laughs> and Tommy started putting himself in the diet, missing it in pasta, putting himself in the diet with his lean fast. Uh, unbelievable. In one month, Tommy lost the pound order and gets a require, and he collected the $20,000. And without $20,000, he was able to give it to the nuns to build the chapel. That was Mr. Tommy Lasora. And something else, you know, with Tommy, we play in New York, we used to go to Mass at the St. Patrick Church at Cathedral. And one time, I remember, we went to mass and you know you start collecting making collection from the people of church and mass and guess the two person who collect the making collection that day and they both Italian Billy Martin and Tommy La Sorda. <laughs> I was so impressed yeah. when I see those two great person, great personality, two future Hall of Fame, make a collection of mass for the church. That was interesting. That was, that's how I described Tommy Lasora. Uh, wonderful remembrance, uh, remembrances of the late Tommy Lasorda, um, Hall of Fame manager with the Los Angeles Dodgers from the late seventies through the nineties, winner of two world championship teams. We do have a few minutes remaining with Manny Moda. Uh, we do want to take questions from the audience, which we're doing in the Zoom group chat. We have a question from Martin Brody. Hey, wasn't Manny one of the greatest pinch hitters of all time? Martin, yes, absolutely. And that leads into this next slide. This is a baseball card from 1980. And it shows one of the highlights from the 1979 season when Manny Mota set the all-time pinch mark with his 145th pinch hit. A pretty amazing record. Um, And um, uh, not only a, a tribute to his longevity, but his skill as a pinch hitter who hit for a very high average in a very difficult role. And I understand, Manny, that after this pinch hitting record, you were invited to the White House by then President Jimmy Carter. Tell us about that. Oh, that was a great honor and great privilege to get invited to the White House by the Mr. Jimmy Carter, United States President. He invited the whole family. And that was something special for us, something we will never forget, the way the President Carter take care of us and treating the whole family at the White House. That was beautiful. That was great headship by the President Carter to bring the Mota family to the White House. 
That's something we will never forget. That was very kind for the President Carter. And we're so grateful to him for doing that. And after that, I mean, I just meet Mr. Carter in Atlanta and I expressed our gratitude for inviting us to your house. He was a great, great person, which we really admire. We have a question from Rob Lanterman in the chat room. Did the Pirates get a positive response from the Houston players when it came to postponing the start of the season following Dr. King's death? So you played the Astros on that Wednesday. Did you hear from any of the Astros players to get their thoughts on this whole deal? Oh, we get together. We talked to the players in the other team, especially to the African-American, and we all together for the same cause. And we express our thanks for joining us in that situation in honor to Martin Luther King. Because that way we stick together and make all of us stronger as a person, as a human being, and as a teammate. We should mention that when the Pirates did play opening day on that Wednesday, after the two days of not playing, uh, the Astros had an interesting lineup. They had five Black and Latino players in the lineup. So they had quite a bit of African-American and Latino representation. Brock Davis was in the lineup that day. Hall of Famer Joe Morgan, uh, Jimmy Wynn, Hal King, and a Latino shortstop named Hector Torres. So certainly the Astros, they had pretty heavy representation of minority players as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, question from Elvis Gomez or Elvis Gomez. Uh, here's what Elvis says. Good chat today. Uh, he is a fan of the Tigres del Lice from the Dominican Republic, <laughs> now lives in the New Jersey area. And Elvis wants to know, is Manny still involved in anything baseball related these days? Well, with the Dodger organization, which I've been for 52 years, I'm very proud to be part of this great organization and part of this great city. LA is our home, away from home. The Dodger organization, they treating us a great deal of respect, starting from the O'Malley family to the present ownership. We're so proud and grateful to be part of this great organization and also to play and be part of the Nisei organization in the Dominican Republic for over 20 years. Do you still go to spring training with the team, Manny? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope and pray we have a spring training in 2021. The Dodgers are so kind to invite me to spring training and so grateful to the Dodgers organization for all of the things they do for me and my great family. Just to give you an idea of Manny's longevity with the Dodgers, not only did he play for them for over a decade, but he also served as a coach, either as a first base coach or as a hitting coach for 33 years, which is simply remarkable. All right, as we get set to wrap up our conversation, I thought we would end on a bit of a lighter note. Um, I love this. This is um, uh, a little bit of film and baseball history coming together. <laughs> One of my favorite comedies, uh, 1980, <laughs> Airplane. Uh, in the movie Airplane, uh, there's a famous scene where this troubled pilot, Ted Stryker, played by Robert Hayes, uh, he has to take over trying to emergency land the plane. And as he's doing this, a variety of random thoughts go through his head, uh, some of which have nothing to do with landing a plane. At one point, he says, pinch hitting for Pedro Borbon, Manny Moda, Moda, Moda. When you saw this, Manny, for the first time, what did you think? Did you know this was going to happen? No, I was surprised. I watched the movie. And all of a sudden, I hear, now pinch hitting for Pedro Borbon. Money, more than I say, how are going to be cheap for Purple Bones? Pedro playing for the Reds, and I'm playing for LA. But Pedro and I were teammates in the Dominican Republic, and we played for Tommy Lasora. Tommy was the manager. Wow. When we played for Lisa in the Dominican Republic. Did you ever pinch it for Pedro there? Do you remember? No, because I was, team, I was teammate of Pedro, and also I was his manager. 
And oh, okay. I never had the, or the opportunity to paint chief or Pedro. But before we finish, let me remember something happened with Tommy Asora. Yeah. One time, I used to paint chief with the game, the line. Tommy always told me, be ready from the eighth inning on. I don't want to see the dog out for six or seven innings. Just come on the eighth, okay? And one time, we played San Francisco Giants. And they pitched in Gary LaBelle, tough left-hander. And we got the winning run in second base. But what happened? I believe that game went to extra innings. And we don't have anybody to pinch run for the guy who was running in second base. And he was very slow, you know, punching Jury here like me, line dry right here. The outfielder, they play shallow. And before I went to the plate, Tommy called me. He said, Manny, I want to do something in this situation. We got a slow man running second base. I want to send the runner. It's going to be hit and run. You better hit the ball because we figure the basics. That's the only way that guy can score from second base. I say, okay, Tommy, that's an order. Okay, in the first pitch, you know, I used to be, I used to hit more ball from the middle of the plate, middle of the, the field to the other side. And when that guy break from second to third base, the third baseman went to cover the back. That opened the hole for me. And the pitch was middle ring. I keep my hands inside. Got a basic to left field, and we win the game. And that was the only way that guy can score for second base because he was so slow. And besides that, they don't play me too deep. And that was the only time in my baseball career which I get the sign, hit the run sign with the main scoring position and two outs. That's great. That's great. Well, as you so often did, you came through. You were great at using the entire field. You could hit left, center, right. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you batted 304. I was the lucky. I was the lucky. I was lucky hitter. I was blessing. I was blessing hitter. Well, you may have been lucky to have the talent to begin with, but you still had to go out there and do it. And that takes that takes skill and determination and hard work. And you lasted for 20 years doing it. So. It's amazing. Uh, Manny, we want to thank you. Um, this has really been an honor for me personally, an honor for the Hall of Fame. We also want to thank your son, Jose Mota, who is an Angels broadcaster, played in the majors in the early 90s with the Padres and Royals. Jose is with, there with you today. And your daughter has helped us out as well. I, I, I'm forgetting your daughter's first name, but I want to credit her as well. Cecilia Mota and Cecilia. my wife, my wife, my MVP, my wife Margarita, she's the MVP in my life. So they're all there with you today. Uh, the daughter, Cecilia, son, Jose, and uh, your wife, Margarita. Uh, I know you both do a great job with your Manny Mota Foundation. Uh, it's a great charitable cause that you've been running for many, many years. We really thank you for being with us. Uh, it has been a pleasure. We also want to thank the Ford Motor Company for their generous support of this virtual Voices of the Game program with Manny Moda. Also, all of their support for all the programs we'll be doing in 2021. Thank you again, Manny. Uh, it's been a real highlight for me. It's been a great day just having the opportunity to talk to you for an hour. Bruce. Yes. We finish? We are done, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Manny. Because, Appreciate because, your time. Because I want to thank ask. everybody that uh, listened to us that. and watched us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this very special program on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, listen, folks, have a great day. Uh, spring training is just around the corner, we hope. Hopefully it'll begin about a month from now in February. Thanks for being with us. Greetings from the Hall of Fame. Take care.